Ready? Yeah. Welcome to Abel. I'm Callan Blair. I'm an actress living in New York City. I'm Allie B. Gorey, and I'm an actress living in New York City who happens to be visually impaired. Our goal is to make the entertainment industry a more inclusive place, one conversation at a time. We hope to break down the stereotypes surrounding disability in film, TV, and theater. It's time to see art that mirrors all the people who support it. It's time for ABLE. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> we have a question to begin with. Okay. Why are you an artist? <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> I would like to be brilliant, but I don't have a brilliant answer. I was doing my undergrad at Northeastern University. I was a finance major, and clearly I'm not using any of that today. But prior to that, I always remember my experience when I went to go see The Phantom of the Opera in London. I was maybe eight or nine years old. My grandma took me to the Phantom of the Opera and it wasn't captioned or interpreted. There was no access, but I was so taken by the spectacle. And even though I didn't know what they were saying, it's a very visually clear story. And I think that sparked something in me. And from that moment on, it was always kind of in the back of my brain that this would be so great to do. And in middle school, the drama teacher pulled me into audition for the play. And I didn't think that was for me. I was gonna play soccer, but the teacher wouldn't let up. And I did Alice in Wonderland. I played the white rabbit and the bug bit. <laughs> How did you get involved at Deaf West? Deaf West had an open call for a musical called Pippin. They were doing it with the Center Theater Group and out in LA. And I thought, why not? I'll just have fun with it. So I went in, I got called back, and the next thing I knew I was on a plane to LA. I love Deaf West. I am so grateful to them for all they taught me and how they really allowed me to grow as an artist. They let me work with other deaf actors, deaf people who I looked up to who were role models of mine, and with an incredible hearing cast as well. It was just yeah. phenomenal. You've done Hunchback and you've done Deaf West, you've done... Um, Worked at the Guthrie and the Steppenwolf. And you're coming off of your Broadway debut. All inclusive projects. Mm -hmm. If you could get everyone in the room, you could get every artistic director, every playwright, every screenwriter, every casting director mm -hmm. in a room, and they'd all be receptive, what, what would you want to share with them? So, Hunchback, for example clearly is a musical. So for casting directors and playwrights and composers who are thinking about casting a show like this, they want singers, right? Obviously, that's the first person you would think to call in. You wouldn't necessarily think about inclusion and making sure deaf people have the opportunity to audition because the question number one on everyone's mind is can this person sing? So I remember I asked my team I said to them, I, I'd like to audition for this role. And my team, my representation told me no, because I'm not a singer. And that put me in a weird place because sometimes you have to go knocking on the door yourself. I had to show them that it would work because the character, Quasimodo, is deaf. Why shouldn't he be played by a deaf actor if we want to do this authentically? And when I said that to them, it was like a light bulb went off in their head that it was something they'd never thought of. Just if I hadn't been in the room, if I hadn't given them that moment of education, if I hadn't let them open their minds and open their hearts and really wake up and think outside the box, I wouldn't have had that opportunity. And once I said it, it was like, oh, of course a deaf character should be played by a deaf actor. Let's do that. And I think that the same thing can be done for roles that are traditionally written as hearing characters. I think, of course, people behind the table might think, you know, oh, well, we're going to have to pay for interpreters for rehearsals. It's going to get tricky. But I challenge people to check their assumptions, have a conversation, and figure out the logistics. I mean, for example, in musical theater, casting directors tend to hire an accompanist for those 
right. auditions, right? That's somebody who needs to be compensated. What's the difference between hiring an accompanist and hiring an interpreter? I think today, with all the strides we've made in diversity and inclusion, I think the one thing that people still need to remember is we've got to think out of the box, get out of your head, and put those assumptions aside. And it only happens when you let us in the door to start that dialogue. What roles maybe in musical theater would you dream about playing that aren't traditionally played or aren't traditionally deaf characters? In the musical theater canon, I would love to do the last five years. I would love to play Jamie. I'd really love to do something new too, yeah. something that hasn't been done before. I'd, I'd love to do a new musical that has nothing to do with being deaf. I have always wanted to see more deaf playwrights because we need more of a deaf perspective. So that's my dream, is to see deaf people writing plays. I mean, I wouldn't mind working on a Sondheim musical. <laughs> He's, I, I gotta say that. So Tribes is a play that was not written by a deaf playwright. Right. However, it includes deaf talent. It does. And it's about a deaf experience. Yeah. It is, yes, exactly. It's interesting to talk about tribes, for example, because you're right. Yes, it was written by a person who is not deaf, a person who is hearing. So that hearing person's lens is on the play in that story. So there are moments in the play that don't ring authentic to me. They don't ring true to me. But what I appreciate about the play is that the playwright put in the script that this deaf character has to be played by deaf talent. And that is now printed in the script when it's distributed so that it's not open to interpretation. I think often you lose authenticity when people don't observe and respect that deaf people should play deaf characters. Do you feel like when a disability is written about in general, sometimes it's very digestible for uh, the consumer? Or archetyped? Or archetyped. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. When I see characters with disabilities, they often have these storylines that are very woe is me and built to emotionally trigger the audience and be this kind of inspiration porn. But people with disabilities are just human beings. I don't want people to feel sorry for me. That's why I say we need to create more work by including diverse people. I think in general, with collaboration, with more inclusive teams, we'll have a better understanding of where everyone's coming from. Right. If it's just one person, it's one experience, then their lens is limited and it can be more challenging. I'm visually impaired. I have friends who are visually impaired. We have completely different views on life and the world. I think that it needs to be stressed to audiences that not all deaf people are the same. You kind of touched on this. There are storylines where the disability is the driving plot, when there can be so many storylines where it's a part of the, the character's experience, but it's not the, dri it's not the driving... Um... Or the defining characteristic. Right. Right. Like, you walk down the street. You might walk by 10 people. How can you tell if any of them are a person with a disability? And that's why we, we people with disabilities struggle to find work because oftentimes we're relegated to the sidelines and the question we need to find an answer to is which battles are worth fighting? Who are, who's going to be receptive to feedback? Because if you don't find the right people to work with, it's just not gonna work. I guess a question for you as a person who's visually impaired, how do you advocate for yourself? Like when you go into an audition room for a role that isn't necessarily a visually impaired character. I ask for large print if I'm getting sides. And if I go to a dance audition, I tell the choreographer that I will not switch lines. Sorry about it. You know, I say this is just how I... Yeah, do. you don't have to apologize yeah. for that. Yeah. Oh, no. Never apologize. And that's no. Totally. And that it took me a while to be unapologetic mm. in asking for what I needed. When I was first starting out, I never wanted to be a burden. 
but it's not a burden. It's just getting your needs met. So it's just asking for things ahead of time. And have people been really receptive when you've asked? Honestly? Mm. Mm. Be honest here. No, yeah. that's the... it's not always met with. Sometimes it's just ignored and I don't even get a response if I ask for accommodation. Yeah, we've I've had very similar experiences. And first of all, I've learned, you know, never apologize for anything because it is what it is. I'm deaf. So I need an interpreter. It's a fact. That's how we communicate. So if they, meaning casting directors or producers, won't get us an interpreter, I don't want to work with those people. It's a waste of time. However, you do have to fight for some things. Mm -hmm. I mean, both of us are hustling. We want work. If we do the work, then the next generation won't have to go through what we are going through. Yes. It just takes one person to make a change. One person to open the door. The rest is history. Yes. John, do you feel like there have been leaps made since you started your career? Steps. I mean, I wish we could make leaps. I don't think we're there yet. I'd be lying if I said we were. Often when I see actors who are hearing playing deaf roles, I feel like the production suffers. The production yes, value suffers. the story suffers. suffers. How do we create art that can empower the community that's being represented? Because the next generation is coming, and if they see that happening, and we're not doing anything, how are they going to respond? How do we right. give authenticity to, to pieces of art? Because if not, they're going to suffer. And sometimes there's controversy, and we, we don't want controversy to happen. We want authenticity. The issue seems very cyclical. Is it with casting? Is it with the clients, the, the producers and the directors? Or is it with the audience? Or is it with all of them? I believe that casting directors work really hard and try really hard, but ultimately the final decision maker is the producer, not the casting director. You, you've probably heard of um, I know the CSA doing these diversity workshops and events. Those have helped a lot. Have you done one of those? No, but I've heard about it and I would love... I think the next one will be next year. But they're a great way for the casting director community to work together. They come up together across the country to see the work of performers with disabilities. And it's a really great start, you know, educating casting directors. But I think ultimately producers, they're the ones who need to be swayed. As you were training at Deaf West, did you have any educators who made a big impact on you and maybe didn't let you make excuses? When I first started rehearsals for Pippin, two co-founders of Deaf West, Ed Water Street and Linda Bove, were both huge forces in my journey. So for example, when you look at a script and go to sign it, you might not necessarily really understand what it means right off the bat. And they both asked me, they would challenge me and say, what is that interpretation that you're giving us? What does it really mean? And they challenged me to unpack a text and really translate it. And they taught me how to translate for the stage, which is very different than you sign when you sign on camera, mm -hmm. because you're projecting your signs the way you might project your voice if you're a hearing actor, which isn't something I'd thought about before. You know, if there are people in the back row, they gotta be able to see what you're signing. So it needs to it needs to carry, just like a human voice needs to carry to the back of the house. Cool. So that was something they imparted on me that I'll never forget. Yeah. Okay, so John. Okay. We have this game. We will say a one word phrase, a one word word <laughs> or phrase, and we'd like you to answer with the first thing you think of. Oh God. Hollywood. Tough. Theater. Storytelling. ASL. Language. Arts education. 
I think the for the younger generation, I think arts education is such an important way of passing on tradition and giving them something to like a torch to carry forward. Disability. When I think of disability, I think of inclusion, but I don't think of myself as a person with a disability. I think of myself as an actor who happens to be deaf. I agree. Artist mission. Ooh. Jeez, that's a good one. <laughs> All right. I would say making a positive impact on an audience. Pizza. Cheese. <laughs> <laughs> New York City. Exhausting. I'm hot. <laughs> Joy. Honestly? Real Housewives. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Dorinda. Love. Yay! <laughs> when is the date? October 27th. Look at all the stuff. We're getting ready. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's We're coming. We're so excited for you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks, Craig. Thank you, Craig.